Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. And this is a pre-recorded show. I may be in the chat room, but this is a pre-recorded show because I am going to be on the road while this is airing. And I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to have access to good internet or any of that. So I decided to pre-record with our great guest today, Garrett Graff. He's a distinguished journalist and internationally best-selling historian. And he spent nearly two decades covering politics, technology, national security, and all that. He has a um, a book that's out, uh, and it's a very interesting book. And the name of the book is UFO, the Inside Story of the U.S. Government's Search for Alien Life Here and Out There. And uh, thank you all for supporting the show. And uh, check out our website, podcastufo.com. And I'm bringing in our guests right now. Hello, Garrett. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for being here. And you, uh, this, I have to say right off the bat, what what sparked your interest enough to uh, write, you know, do a deep dive and and uh, and write this book? Yeah, um, I am not someone who has spent a lifetime on this subject. Um, I I was not someone raised on. The X Files or, or Star Trek or uh, someone who devours sci-fi novels in my spare time. I'm not a lifelong ufologist. I'm someone who covers national security. Um, I've covered national security in Washington for 20 years. Um, my previous books are about things like nuclear weapons in the Cold War, the war on terrorism, the uh, cybersecurity, uh, my book preceding this one uh, was about Watergate and Richard Nixon's presidency. And what got me interested in this subject was I began to see and feel this change in the way that people in and around national security circles in Washington were talking about UFOs and you know what the government now calls UAPs that there was, uh, as, as your viewers and listeners know, uh, this series of reporting by Politico and the New York Times in 2017 about more extensive Pentagon efforts studying UFOs than anyone had understood existed until then. There was this follow-up reporting about Navy pilots, Navy aviators who had seen and had encounters with craft that they felt defied you know physics as they understood it that that moved in ways that they could not understand and that they believed was technology that the u.s couldn't match and you began to see these conversations in and around washington change and shift and for me there was one very specific moment that got me interested in in this sort of go, going from like a background noise story to something I was interested in writing a book about, which was in December 2020, John Brennan gave an interview to a DC journalist named Tyler Cowen. Now, John Brennan, of course, was uh, in, in 2020 had just wrapped up the better part of a decade as CIA director and White House Homeland Security Advisor. And he was a career lifelong intelligence officer. Uh, I've covered him. I've uh, interviewed him. He's a really serious, thoughtful guy who has spent, you know, most of the 21st century at the upper ranks of the U.S. intelligence community. And he said in this December 2020 interview, this incredibly weird answer to a question about UFOs, where he said, you know, yes, there are things out there that puzzle us. We don't know what they are. And then in very tortured syntax, he said something along the lines of, and some might say this phenomenon could constitute what some might recognize as a new form of life. Mm, and I remember it was that. Yeah. Incredibly odd statement for someone like John Brennan to make. Um, and particularly in my view, because there can't be that many things that puzzle John Brennan. Like if he woke up in the morning wanting the answer to a question, there's a massive $60 billion a year intelligence apparatus that goes out and tries to find it for him. And so if he was leaving office saying, yeah, this whole UFO thing really puzzles me, 
that felt like something that was worth diving into more as a book subject. And so this book tries to tell two related and intertwined threads um, going back, you know, 80 years or so to the dawn of the flying saucer age in the 1940s, both the military and the government's work on UFOs and understanding UFOs here, as well as the evolving science and astronomy about the size and scope of the universe, you know, what, what they call the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Right, right. Um, so I bet as you're doing the research for this book, you're probably shaking your head. You probably learned so much that you had no idea. I mean, that's what happened with me. You know, I had I had a what I consider an unexplained UFO sighting back in 2007. Really didn't pay that much attention to the topic at all. But after I had that, I started looking into the topic and then thinking, wow, you know, these aren't all tinfoil hatters. These are some serious people talking about some serious things, you know, um, and we call it, you know, the modern UFO era of 1947 forward. But there's been things, you know, unexplained things. Of course, you know, the further back you have, the further back you go, the less data you have, of course. And, uh, you know, but there's been mysterious things, you know, reported for, you know, centuries. So uh, it's really fascinating when you look into it real deeply like that. But uh, so I, I'm just asking you what, uh, what was the most kind of thing that you can think of right now that kind of stood out that you didn't, you ne never knew before when you started looking into this? So to me, I think the thing that most wowed me in my research was coming to understand just how much our understanding of the size, scale, and scope of the universe has changed in recent decades. You know, as, as late mm. as the 1990s, we didn't understand that there was a single planet outside of our own solar system. And we now believe effectively every star has planets and that a large number, not necessarily a large percentage, but a large total number of those planets across the universe are going to fall into what scientists call that Goldilocks zone. The, hmm. uh, you know, not too hot, not too cold, uh, capable of supporting water, capable of supporting uh, an atmosphere and would be habitable to life as we understand it and would recognize it. Um, and that across the universe now, we now believe that there are one sextillion habitable planets and that's a billion trillion habitable planets and so to me you what know a number. I, I, yeah it's an incredible yeah. number and, and you know you can believe the chance of life is rare you can believe the chance of intelligent life is even more rare but like it's hard to think that we are a one in sextillion chance across the universe and particularly yeah. Again, as we come to understand the way that the universe has evolved, um, you know, the James Webb Space Telescope is transforming the way that we think about and understand the beginnings of the universe. And that, you know, we're actually a really young solar system yeah. in a very old universe. Um, you know, we're about four and a half billion years old in a 14 billion year old universe. And the James Webb Space Telescope has discovered galaxies and stars that were forming within 300 million years of the creation of the, the universe. And so you're left with these like incredible thought experiments about, you know, we could have seen multiple billion year civilizations rise and fall. Um, you know, civilizations that across the universe uh, filled with intelligent life, you know, so advanced as to be unrecognizable to us. And have those civilizations rise and fall, you know, before our solar system even begins to gather out of dust. Right. And so to mm -hmm. me, you know, I start this book with this argument that I think is increasingly undeniable 
that the math is on the side of the aliens, that our universe probably both teams with life and teams with intelligent life. Whether any of that life is close enough that we will ever notice it or have meaningful contact with it, or whether our human civilization will last long enough to explore the universe at the scale that we need to in order to find it, um, those to me are much more open uh, questions. And I think, you know, actually quite the opposite. There's some very strong evidence that, you know, we could be functionally alone in the universe at this particular moment, even if across history, there, uh, there is a lot of life and a lot of intelligent life. Interesting. And, uh, you know, I've thought, uh, I've heard other people talk about, you know, societies lining up. And I've mentioned this a number of times, uh, astrophysicist uh, visiting uh, NASA, a scientist, that was on this show said that his basically he and his fellows ha having conversations that if any society goes through the technological uh, bottleneck without blowing themselves up, then they're, you know, most likely will be traveling the stars, you know, and I thought that was quite, you know, quite an interesting quote. And um, I, you know, one of the, one of the things about um, the possibilities, and you just mentioned that, a mass number that no one could possibly conceive uh, of the possibilities. Um, another astrophysicist I had recently on the show said that they, you know, statistically they they're thinking about in our galaxy alone about forty billion uh, Earth-like planets, which is it's all fascinating to me. Now I know a lot of um, most time I hear I hear the argument when I speak with uh, people like you and also, you know, uh, many scientists is the outrageous distances and a good way to get a good scale on that is to say if the sun was in uh, Washington, D.C. and the size of a grapefruit, the earth would be the size of a ball and a ballpoint pen and the nearest star would be in San Francisco. That's about that's that's putting it to scale. And it's really it's really hard to imagine, you know, the vast distances. But um, but the one thing I've always thinking of, and I'm I'm not saying that what we're being visited by by is aliens. I don't know, you know, I don't have the answer to that. And I always kind of run away from people that do have the answer. Um, think they do, I should say. Uh, but um, I've always thought maybe there's something about space time that they know that we don't know uh, something about physics that is figured out when you think about, you just talked about the possibilities of, you know, an intelligence growing over millions of years or beyond us, you know, the type of thing. So who knows what can be figured out? I know you can't defy physics really, but, but who knows if something can be discovered within physics that could, that could actually solve uh, the travel situation. So I don't, you know, I mean, these are just thoughts. Uh, you know, I just wonder what you're, what you think about all that. Uh, Absolutely, uh, and I think answering that requires unpacking a couple of different things. One is, I think one of the challenges that a lot of people have in discussing this topic is people try to come at, at the topic of UFOs and extraterrestrials broadly as either a full skeptic or a full believer. And that, you know, when you read books about this subject, they are generally either dedicated towards proving that aliens exist and starting with the premise that of course aliens exist, or starting with the premise that you know, UFOs are not real and aliens are not real and aliens do not exist. And that they're sort of written by full skeptics. And, you know, there's a long intellectual tradition of these, you know, going back to Donald Menzel at Harvard um, in the in the 40s and 50s. You know, I tried to land somewhere in between 
because I think that the most likely case requires holding some views that may seem contradictory at once at the same time. So what I mean by that is, you know, I think that I settle somewhere where extraterrestrials exist. We're probably too far away from them to have meaningful contact with them. But UFOs are represent a real phenomenon. UAPs represent a real phenomenon. And that the answers to what UFOs and UAPs could be could still blow our minds and transform our understanding of the universe and our place in it, even if it ends up being a terrestrial explanation and not an extraterrestrial explanation. You know, to your mm -hmm. point on physics, physics to me is a huge part of this, that I think the the answer to UFOs and UAPs almost certainly is most simply that the world and the universe is a much weirder place than we currently understand it to be. And mm -hmm. that I think we should be humble about just how weird the world and the universe probably actually is. Um, you know, that a big chunk of UFOs and UAPs are most likely astronomical, meteorological, and atmospheric phenomenon that we don't yet understand. Um, you know, there's just been some interesting research in the last couple of weeks about the possibility that the Foo Fighters in World War II, those sort of balls of light that seem to track yeah. fighter planes at night through the skies of Europe, um, probably represent plasma that uh, plasma balls that we did not really understand or recognize at the time. Um, then you get into the physics category, which is, you know, I think that our biggest fault in this is probably assuming that we actually have any understanding of what physics actually does right now in our lifetime. That the again, we need to approach our understanding of physics with a great deal of humility, that the the this science that we consider ourselves so knowledgeable about uh, really is, for the most part, only a few decades and, and a century old. Um, last January, the world's oldest human died. She was a French nun. She was 118 years old. And Harvard astronomy chair Avi Loeb points out that everything that we know about relativity and quantum physics, we learned in her lifetime. So imagine wow. how much more we have to learn about physics in one more human lifetime. Imagine what we might learn in 500 years or a thousand years or 10,000 years or a million years. Um, you know, last summer for the first time, we spotted in space the uh, gravitational waves that move through space and bend space time. We had theorized that they existed, but had never actually spotted one in real life uh, until last summer. The Italian astrophysicist Carlo Rivelli, um, he has a new book out arguing for the existence of what he calls white holes, which is basically his <laughs> theory for what happens at the end of a black hole. And... <laughs> It, he says, you know, look, we've never seen a white hole, but our knowledge of black holes is recent enough that when he started his major academic appointment in the year 2000, his department chair came to him and said, you know, Carlo, you don't really believe in black holes, do you? Because in 2000, we had never actually seen a black hole before. 
And now we understand that the universe is widely populated with them. Um, mm. So, you know, you get into these questions about how intelligent beings, intelligent civilizations, other civilizations could move through outer space. And, you know, I don't think we have the foggiest idea about the technologies or wrinkles in physics that might allow for some of these things to happen. Um, and, and by the way, the answers could be really, really, really weird. Um, you know, this could be mm -hmm. parallel universes, interdimensional travel, time travel from the past or future, things again that would blow our minds yeah would change forever the way that we look at the world and the universe and still not be aliens um and, and that to me is like part of the challenge in uncovering all of this is just really admitting up front just how humble we probably should be about our understanding of the world right i agree with all that um, i'm going to share this uh, because this just was sent to me today. I thought it was really interesting. And this is a, uh, a FedEx uh, pilots. They filmed a UFO that uh, followed their cargo plane for over a half an hour. And it's very similar to the Foo Fighters. That's when you mentioned that. Um, I'm going to bring up the video here. And uh, it shows uh, they did did video. Whoops. Okay, let's try that again. And it looks like something plasma. Now, the, the odd thing, <laughs> I don't know if you can hear the audio of this, but are you hearing the audio of this? No, no. Okay. So, yeah, the, it, it's good because of some of the language. <laughs> but anyway, it's showing this. It's showing this thing. They're, they're filming. The FedEx pilots are filming this and uh, not understanding what it is. But this thing followed them you know the, the the strange thing and you know and i agree you know it's hard to know i think we know very very little you know there's this great uh quote um um by uh, newton that basically says what we know is a drop what we don't know is an ocean and you know i really think that's true we have no clue of this and so the foo fighters and this you know they seem to be have some type of intelligence following something like they used to, they used to follow along the wings of, you know, purportedly uh, alongside the wings of the craft. Um, I spoke to a, uh, an American airlines pilot. He was deadheading on a flight, you know, to get to another location sitting right beside me. And this was right when the New York times article came out um, in December of 2017 and I was flying like for Christmas and I said to him, hey, did you catch that article about UFOs? And, you know, he was a, a pilot, an American Airlines pilot. And he said, no, uh, but I know they exist. And I said, well, tell me what, you know, what, what happened? And he said a green orb was for over 300 miles. He was in an F-16 when he was in the uh, Air Force. And his uh, weasel weapon op weapons operator in the back was sleeping, which I heard they never do. They were, he said he was relocating a plane. And uh, so he let him sleep and it lit up the whole cockpit in green and followed him for like 300 miles. And he said he was never going to report that. He just was, you know, the stigma of the whole thing. So I asked him, I said, would you mind being on my show anonymous and talking about it? And he said, no way. He said, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to have, give anything out there that could challenge his, you know, career. So, it's kind of sad that it has a stigma because, you know, you're you're have done, have done enough research in it that it is some type of real phenomenon that is happening. People are really seeing things. It's not like I mean, I know I'd have to say I would have to have been drugged or something to have seen what I've seen and not be above me. You know what I saw back in 2007, which uh, I just that just kept me going on this whole topic because it was it was actually a disc shaped thing it had a blue glow and it moved and stopped and then moved again and it made no absolutely no sound at all and that was the most eerie part for me because i just thought you know this how's this thing doing that and you don't hear anything 
But I mean, there there is an explanation for whatever we see, no matter what it is, when people see ghosts or whatever it is, there's always an explanation. But like you're saying, we may not understand what that explanation is. Yeah, let me give you two uh, examples about you know just how new our search to understand all of this actually is. Um, you know, we have not even begun to do the low hangingest of all low hanging fruit of trying to search the the universe for you know messages or proof of extraterrestrial civilizations. Um, you know, we, the you'll you'll hear critics of the SETI program, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, you know, talk about, well, we've been listening for, you know, 50, 60 years and, you know, haven't heard anything, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, we're looking at like tiny fractions of the sky. Um, and mm -hmm. two, again, concrete examples about that. We have not even searched the moon at a level of detail yet sufficient to recognize if there are other lunar landers on the moon. That, hmm. uh, you know, this is not me saying I believe that there are other lunar landers on the moon. This is me saying our search is so new that the one place we have left a lander, we haven't even bothered to check whether anyone else left a lander there. Um, and, you know, that it's only been in the last couple of years we've had comprehensive photography of the moon at a level of detail great enough to search. And we have never actually applied the, you know, computing power and artificial intelligence at this point yet to do that study. Second example, you know, you, you talked about, you know, the possibility, uh, you know, the, the challenge of covering space uh, is the vast distances that, um, you know, you, you're looking at, you know, any, any civilization that conquers interstellar travel would probably need to figure out how to do it at a fraction of the speed of light, not the speed of light, not a large fraction of the speed of light, but, you know, some small fraction of the speed of light, which is, you know, far faster than anything we have yet designed to go. We don't have on Earth right now the technology to recognize something moving through our own solar system at a fraction of the speed of light. So... You know, one of the weird answers you're left with in the, you know, uh, among these thought experiments about the interstellar travel and extraterrestrial visitors is our solar system could be currently being traversed by alien craft daily, weekly, monthly, once a decade, once a century, you know, once a millennia, uh, and we wouldn't have any technology right now that could recognize those craft as they come through our solar system. And, it, you know, you, you think about, and, and you and I were talking a little bit about this before the show starts, one of the biggest fallacies, I think, in the world of ufology is that anyone would care that we're here in the first place. That, you know, we have this sense that aliens would bother covering the vast distances of interstellar space to come and check on us, whether that's for friendship purposes or to invade us and conquer us and use our organs for food or energy. Um, that, you know, Hollywood has sort of given us these three different first contact scenarios. The they are all unambiguous and definitive. You know, you have the Independence Day flying saucer over the White House, take me to your leader alien visit. 
you have the Jody Foster contact radio message to Earth from outer space. And then you have, you know, the ET version, which is the stranded lone traveler coming by Earth. And the truth of the matter is probably no one knows we are here. And even if they did know, they wouldn't necessarily care that this idea of first contact visiting Earth in a clear and unambiguous way is probably too human centric. That the first sign of an intelligent universe, uh, an intelligent civilization that we are likely to see is effectively a piece of space trash traversing our our solar system that you know it, a, an old defunct space probe a wreckage of a spacecraft uh you know wreckage uh or or, or a piece of uh some alien space base um you know just sort of floating through our solar system the equivalent uh again as avi loeb talks about it of an empty plastic bag blowing through our cosmic backyard that will, you know, look up one day with our telescopes and see something and say, well, that's not from our Walmart. Like whose Walmart do you think that's, that's visiting from? And, you know, you look at someone like Carl Sagan, who in the 20th century was simultaneously the biggest proponent of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and also the biggest skeptic that aliens were visiting Earth uh, as UFOs. And his argument was never that aliens don't visit Earth. His, his argument was that statistically, you would only expect an alien civilization to pass by every 100,000 or 200,000 years, that they would be more likely to treat Earth as the equivalent of a rest area on the Jersey Turnpike, sort of somewhere where you're stopping off on your way from one interesting place to another. And that Sagan's argument was not aliens don't visit Earth as UFOs. It's, it's that it's statistically unlikely that the thing that you happened to see last Tuesday out your window is the one time in the last 100,000 or 200,000 years that an alien happened to be stopping by. Well, yeah, if if you take that argument at face value, I mean, it's it's an opinion that's really based not truly on anything that we really know or don't know, in my opinion. But um, here is, uh, uh, and I know that, you know, we're, we're looking for techno signatures with the web. And another thing, something that you said about uh, whether they'd care or not, uh, we don't know whether they would care or not. I agree with you, but they could also care too to explore. So they could care to take a look. And I, I have to tell you this, I've told this a number of times on this show because it was long before I really had much of an interest is uh, back in the 1990s, I had a gentleman, I remember his name, Tom Bowden. Uh, he was an insurance adjuster. I've been not adjuster. He was an insurance uh, broker and he sold me basically life insurance and we went over the plans and stuff. And he sat with me in my house. He was uh, older than myself. And uh, eventually in the conversation, we got to talking about other things. And, you know, he said, uh, he talked about being in Vietnam and I said, wow, what was that like? And he said, well, it was pretty unusual because of what I did. And I said, well, what did you do? And he said, I work for a special uh, section of the Air Force. And we were trying to understand what the UFOs were that were showing up during napalming and, you know, situations like that. So I go, really? And, and he said, yeah, something was going on. And it was our job to try to figure it out, you know, what it was. And we never really could get too far. And so he was on his way out the door that that night after we got done talking. And uh, so I said, hey, by the way, what, do you, what, what does the, did the government tell you what they thought they were? And he looks at me and he said, that we're a Petri dish. And uh, 
you probably I had never heard it before and since um, that that whole thought. But I mean, that's just an interesting thing to throw out there. Um, you know, that would imply that, uh, you know, we were it sounds like that we were something seeded and we we're being observed, you know, according to his, you know, his thought and what the government was claiming that they could be. Now, I'm just putting that out there. I'm not saying that I, I've tried to look this person up uh, very deeply, and I found someone out in the Midwest with the same name, insurance broker, but it was not him. I've been trying to get him back on, you know, to talk to him these days when I'm doing this show, just to, can you elaborate more on this, you know, what you were talking about? It's interesting. I, I have no, nothing to back it up, but it's interesting. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, to me, there's, uh, a, a, again, I think part of untangling this subject and trying to understand it is recognizing that there are credible witnesses who point to something without necessarily having to prejudice what that something actually is. Um, and that, you know, to me, there is a series of credible and reliable witnesses across decades, um, you know, across many of these sightings, who all point to something or some things, multiple possibilities, existing as, you know, UAPs, unidentified anomalous phenomenon. And that, you know, you look at these Navy aviators in, in recent years, you look at, um, you know, someone, one of the cases I talk about in the book is 1964, Socorro, New Mexico, a local policeman there named Lonnie yeah. Zamora, um, who is chasing a speeder on his way out of town and see hears an explosion off in the desert and sees what he thinks is an overturned car. He turns his car, his, his cruiser off the road, begins to sort of bump up and down through the gullies over to this overturned car. As he gets closer, he describes it as a football-shaped uh, craft with two figures outside that get inside, and then the craft takes off. Now... There's a New Mexico state trooper who shows up a couple of minutes afterward, uh, sees Lonnie Zamora shaken up um, by whatever it is that he has encountered. Um, he is, the FBI and the military respond and uh, find some circumstantial evidence that something was physically located where Lonnie Zamora says this craft was out in the desert. You know, something happened to Lonnie Zamora in the desert that day in 1964, and he's a pretty credible witness. You know, he's not someone who uh, had any reason to make it up. Um, as you said in some of the people that you've talked to, there's actually a lot of reason to not be the person who comes forward and talks about a UFO encounter. Mm -hmm. And so to me, you know, you look at someone like, Lonnie Zamora, you look at someone like these naval aviators, and it, it points to me that there's something worth investigating here that is uh, deserving of our intention, deserving of greater intention and focus from the government. And it really strikes me that this is something that you know, we should be paying more attention to than we are. And again, the chances are that we could find some really amazing world changing answers wrapped up in here, even if the answer isn't aliens. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And there's been talk lately of, you know, that the interdimensional part has always been part of uh, since I've been, you know, doing this show for 12 years, it's always been part of the possibilities. You're hearing that more and more. And, you know, some of the cases that I've looked into, uh, 
it would kind of work, you know, from what people are reporting. But I mean, that's just another, like you say, mind bending situation to try to figure out what that would look like and what that would be like. You know, for instance, when supposedly if there was craft here or whatever, if they're interdimensional, uh, how could they stay in this dimension or or get back? Is it a power thing? You know, something done through power. I mean, all these things that we just don't understand. And if if that other dimension has to be physically here or can it come from elsewhere? I mean, it's 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 all, um, you know, great stuff to think about. But again, you know, we don't, I don't know. Uh, so I guess I'll ask you this question. Do you think our U.S. government has uh, more answers than we know about, but just something that if they release it, it may show uh, them with some type of weakness in a way that maybe they can't really explain it all. So why even try to explain any of it? I mean, just yeah. what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think to me, uh, again, there are a couple of different things to unpack in, in that question. The first is the government is absolutely covering up the extent of its knowledge about UFOs. Um, probably not for the reasons that people think. Um, you know, for one thing, there is a cloak of secrecy that overlays a lot of this that is some chunk of what the public thinks are UFOs are the government's own secret test projects. Um, you know, historically, we've seen things like the U-2, the SR-71, the A-12 ox cart, the F-117 uh, Nighthawk, the B-2 bomber, um, you know, be what the public thinks are UFOs, but they are the government's own secret test projects. Um, those projects are very much still in existence. Um, you know, just last fall, we saw the military uh, testing for the first time the uh, the, the B-21 uh, stealth bomber, new generation stealth bomber. Um, you know, there are other stealth drones and, and planes and things that we are surely uh, not aware of. There's another cloak of secrecy, which is some chunk of what the public, again, considers UFO sightings are advanced adversary technology being tested against us. You know, this is Chinese drones, Russian drones, Iranian drones, and that you almost certainly see a large number of of public UFO sightings being explained by, you know, the government's knowledge of these classified uh, adversary technologies being tested. And the government gets really squirrely talking about what its understanding of um, other things in our airspace is because it doesn't like talking about its sensors. It doesn't like saying what its sensors detect, what its radar detects, what it notices, what it doesn't notice. And so almost certainly the government knows a fair deal about things like that, that they just don't talk to, you know, that they can't talk about without giving away sensor technology. Then you get to the That's question. The, yeah. Uh, then you get to the question that, that, you, that you're sort of asking, which is, is the government covering up meaningful knowledge of contact with aliens or, or extraterrestrials or non-human intelligences? Um, you know, are there crashed spacecraft? Are there uh, recovered alien bodies or what? Um, you know, the, the buzzword now is, you know, non-human biologics. NHI. Um, <laughs> or, yeah. And that, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons to be dubious that the government is covering up meaningful knowledge about contact uh, or, or, or recovery programs of extraterrestrial knowledge, uh, extraterrestrial civilizations, in part because... You know, this it, it is hard to imagine a bigger secret that the government could be keeping 
uh, and not have any meaningful whispers of it escape. I think actually you're on the right track with where you were heading in your question, which is to me, the most likely answer and certainly what we see documented again and again in the declassified records, such as they have exist and have been shared uh, and made public over the last 80 years, is that the U.S. government is mostly covering up its ignorance of what UAPs and UFOs actually are. That much of the evidence that we have for what the government was covering up at any one given moment is that the government was just as puzzled about what UFOs and UAPs are as, as we are. Right. And I understand without even having to ask you the question that David Grush, you know, came out with this ex extraordinary claim back in June this uh, last year. Um, I was actually at the Washington DC hearing when he was in the, in the room at the time when that all happened. And I understand that, your reply to that before I even ask would be that, you know, this is a secondhand witness. Um, however, I don't know if you followed that um, the, uh, uh, I don't know what his, the director, I guess, of AARO, mm -hmm. uh, Sean Kirkpatrick, basically said, you know, um, in his letter as he was leaving his op-ed or whatever you want to call it, that basically saying that, you know, he he'd only heard from secondhand witnesses, and I that is that is not true because I know personally, uh, you know, a firsthand witness that actually went and testified for four hours uh, with the encounter the that he had. Um, but what I'm getting at is, uh, how would you feel if there was actually uh, a testimony of a firsthand witness that claimed that he actually had uh, that they actually worked on technology, you know, with, let's just say, do you think that would change everything and things would really be looked into deeply, you know, as far as, uh, if these things are compartmentalized, I know you probably have a feeling that none of that may, uh, may or may not exist, but, um, I'm just saying, do you think that would change things if actually a firsthand witness, you know, came forward and, you know, went through the whistleblower, whatever the legal, the legal channels to do it right. So I think part of, uh, part of, un, uh, part of the challenge of David Grush's testimony is almost everything that he says is likely true, maybe even probably true. And it still doesn't just make that one last little leap that the public makes because the public doesn't sort of quite understand the nomenclature and the way that the government sort of speaks and operates. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, David Grush really began last spring with this claim. I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but basically his, the core of his original claim was the U.S. government has a UFO crash retrieval program that has recovered unknown technology that the government believes is extraterrestrial. I think that almost every aspect of that is almost certainly true, except for the last little intellectual leap that people make when they hear that. And what I mean by that is... The U.S. government does have a UFO crash retrieval program. It has had one for almost 100 years. It dates back to World War I, what was originally called the, uh, the, the Foreign Technology Division of the Army Air Corps. And it is a unit that goes around and recovers crashed UFOs, unidentified flying objects. This is how in the World War II, we recover German Messerschmitt fighters and Japanese Zeros and Dornier bombers. 
Uh, in the Cold War, this was the unit that was responsible for picking up Soviet MiGs uh, from friendly countries or non-aligned countries or, or you know, battlefields of the Korean War. Um, UFO is just an unidentified flying object. It doesn't have to be an extraterrestrial spacecraft. So, yes, we have a UFO crash retrieval program. I would bet also that that UFO crash retrieval program has recovered technology that it doesn't know what it is. Um, you know, that would seem to me to be table stakes really for a UFO crash retrieval program is that we're recovering things that we don't know what they are um, either because we're, you know, it is advanced adversary technology we haven't seen before, or it's, you know, pieces of wreckage that, you know, we can't make sense of what that piece of wreckage actually is. I would very much believe, and I think it's, you know, almost probable that the government has a warehouse somewhere that's like all of the weird stuff the government has recovered that we don't know what it is yet. So like the second part of David Grush's statement is probably also true. I will even believe that there's someone on that team who says who's looked at it and says, I believe that this doesn't look like anything humans have made. Um, you know, I think that this is extraterrestrial. We sort of all have that coworker whose opinions are, you know, one standard deviation outside of the rest of the team. Yet when David Grush says, you know, the U S government has recovered unknown technology that, it believes is extraterrestrial. Um, what I think the public hears is that the U.S. government has concluded that it is extraterrestrial. You know that there was a formal briefing in the Situation Room by the Director of National Intelligence to the President of the United States with PowerPoint slides, where she says, uh, you know. Uh, it is with a high degree of confidence in the assessment of 17 intelligence agencies that we've recovered alien technology. I don't think that that's happened. Um, I don't think that's happened probably for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, you know, there, not the least of which is like, that'd be a pretty incredible secret for the government to have, uh, you know, officially concluded in the process that the government goes through to reach an official conclusion. Um, so, you know, I think that part of the challenge of listening to David Grush is that David Grush could be almost entirely telling the truth as he understands it, um, you know, that there are people in the intelligence community who have told him these things, um, you know, people who have told him that they work on these programs that he is talking about, and yet it doesn't necessarily, in my mind, add up to the, you know, two plus two plus two equals eight uh, scenario of, you know, the government has a secret hangar under Area 51 packed with alien bodies. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to say goodbye to KGRA Radio right now. Uh, we'll be back next week uh, with David Scott from Spaced Out Radio. And uh, thank you. I want to continue on just a little bit. Um, because there's a couple of things I wanted to, uh, so we're going to go over time a little bit here, a couple of things I wanted to ask. Uh, so what do you think about when it comes to his claim of the pilots of a few of these things? Um, you know, again, exactly as you predicted, that that feels to me like secondhand knowledge um, that we haven't yet seen uh, evidence to back it up. Uh, I think that there's a lot of reasons to doubt that the government is capable of keeping a secret of that size and scale. And, uh, you know, a lot of evidence, you know, as someone who has covered national security for 20 years, um, has written a lot about the U.S. government's doomsday programs and 9-11 and Watergate and a lot of places where there's a lot of government conspiracy programs or conspiracy theories. You know, my challenge with government conspiracy theories ends up being that they presuppose a level of competence, planning, and forethought that is not on display in the rest of the work that the government does. 
um, you know, could the government keep knowledge of an alien recovery secret for a short period of time? Probably. Could it keep the knowledge of an alien recovery for a long period of time? Maybe with like a very, very, very small group of people. Um, but that's not how David Grush talks about this. He talks about it as a uh, 90-year cover-up stretching back to fascist Italy and World War II that he says in modern terms uh, has about 5,000 people working on it. Um, so, you know, extrapolate that out across the, you know, 80, 90 years of a cover up, you know, maybe 50,000 people, maybe 75,000 people have worked on it over the years or would have been cleared into it in one form or another. Um, that just doesn't seem possible for me in the context of the scale of the cover-up that he's alleging based on what we know about how the government is able to keep secrets. Hmm. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people have talked in theories about that, how, you know, uh, just, you know, to com compartmentalize things to the point where everyone knows pieces, but not the whole, you know, that type of thing to keep this, you know, to hide this, the secrets. Um, I, I love your Freudian slip. Was it uh, government conspiracy programs you said by accident and then changed it to theories? Uh, that was uh, that was pretty funny. But um, now I know you did some work on the nukes. And so you must have looked into the situation at Maelstrom and other places where is supposedly there was interference uh, when it comes to UFOs, uh, not just that, there's been a number, I forget how many cases in total, but where there was, you know, basically a UFO and then something happened with the the weapon systems or something like that. I just wondered if that's something you actually looked into. Um, you know, I've looked into it in the context of looking into a lot of these other things. Um, you know, untangling and getting an understanding of past historical UFO sightings is incredibly hard simply mm. because it's, you know, we don't have the data and, and records that we would want of most of these incidents and trying to figure out what some of these things are, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years later it is really challenging. And, you know, the truth of the matter is most of these things will probably be forever unsolved at this point. Right. I can't, I can't disagree with that at all. I want to thank you so much. And for uh, your book will be linked down in the show notes and in the text below uh, the YouTube and Facebook, etc. The name of the book is UFO, the inside story of the US government's search for alien life here and out there. You've been a great guest. Thank you so much for all your insights. Thanks so yeah. much, a pleasure chatting with you. Is there, just one more thing, is there any further research you're going to do in this or are you just gonna move on to other topics at this point? Uh, you know, I, I I will continue to cover this, uh, you know, more as a magazine writer, which is my, my uh, other life uh, going forward. Um, you know, cause it, I think that there, there is something here and, uh, I, I, along with a lot of other people will be curious to figure out what it is. Excellent. All right. And I don't know if we ever will in our lifetime, but you never know. All right. Thanks so much. Take care. All right, everyone. So we'll be back next week. Uh, we'll be live. Um, and we'll have Dave Scott from spaced out radio. Thank you. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky.